Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. My um, pleasure, Paul. Let's get straight into it. Should pharma companies uh, become healthcare providers? I think that movement is inevitable. It's just a question of who's going to move first and who moves the furthest, fastest. Uh, and a lot of that, I think, is being driven by some of the reform movement that's taking place in the United States with the Affordable Care Act, where we're paying for outcomes as opposed to process. And if you follow that extension all the way through, there's a really good case study where you know, GE jumped into the engine servicing business because airlines don't buy engines, they buy online performance. And so healthcare insurers are buying healthy patients, not treatments. So I think it's an inevitability. So your company provides solutions for communications, essentially, and yes. uh, engagement. How does that and the evolution of that actually fit with what you're saying in terms of the nature of pharma companies changing over the coming years? Well, our basic value proposition is that we connect people with information to execute their job. We have targeted that capability at the life sciences industry as one of the first movements that we make to enable individuals in the, in the food chain, if you will, to be able to very quickly access, consume, and disseminate, and then measure information that helps people make decisions. So whether or not it is a company doing a commercial transaction to a physician, to a patient, to a payer, or the whole flow the whole way through, doesn't really matter to us. We're just a pipeline that moves content and measures it. Okay. Uh, now you have uh, had some background in the telecoms industry. Yes. Now I realize you were with uh, dealing with pharma companies that, that whole period, but telecoms industry obviously is traditionally a B2C. Uh, industry uh, at large. So. Well, the industry, the segment of the industry that I was in was uh, there were two sections of my career. The first was I designed and sold telecommunication systems to large retail pharmacy networks in the United States. Did some of the first retail or mail order pharmacy operations. Second phase of my career is I sold telecommunication systems to integrated healthcare delivery networks. So think hospitals and physicians. Mm. So I actually know both sides of that equation, and then. Through that process, I got very frustrated with my own ability to share information that helped my sales process. So I decided to solve that problem, which is where Prolific comes from. So how much other general experience can you bring from that industry into pharma, which is obviously traditionally regarded as one of the least innovative, perhaps, you know, hamstrung by regulations perhaps, but in general could still has a, a way to go, should we say, in terms of being truly customer-centric. Well, I think that there's, well, when you, if you hadn't added customer-centric, I could probably dispute what you have to say. I would, I would suggest that the uh, innovative nature of the pharma industry is bifurcated. Phenomenally innovative in the R&D side of the business in terms of molecular research, treatment protocols, et cetera. On the business side, somewhat hamstrung. However, it was the industry that put the iPad on the map and because they were the first industry to jump on the capabilities of uh, this new uh, computing paradigm, which has completely transformed enterprise software. So there, and the ripples of that, we haven't even really begun to see yet. Now, in terms of their go-to-market strategies, that's a little bit different. And I think you're, you know, it's kind of like an aircraft carrier. You can water ski behind it, but it takes a little while to do a loop around. They're turning the ship, and they're starting to make some changes, and much of that's being forced on them by the market. Some are going to survive, some are not. And of course, we, we have been talking at least about closed loop marketing. We've seen the, the iPads. I don't regard that as new news anymore, and I'm sure you don't either. No. Um, we are you know, seeing pretty mass adoption now across the board. So in terms of differentiation, in terms of where this is actually going, can you give us any kind of prediction or illustration of how you could see this a few years from now? Yeah, I think the, um, so I use the metaphor, you know, we, or, well, we've gone through this evolution where, you know, forget the devices, because the devices are just appliances, it's really the software that, that the devices use. And we've gone from this, with Jeffrey Moore, the Stanford professor crossing the chasm, talks about as the systems of record, which are the legacy systems that are predominantly databases that capture information so that you can talk about your customers. And then we're in this era now of systems of engagement, which are, I'm sorry, the first one was systems of record, and then we're into systems of engagement, which are applications that touch people. And those are things like closed loop marketing, e-detailing, uh, call reporting, those kinds of things. The future is systems of anticipation, and not the waiting for things, but the prediction of things. And the best example that I could use, we all use a system of anticipation pretty much every day and don't even think about it, 
Google Maps. And if you think about what Google Maps does, it knows where you're going, it knows where you are, and it makes suggestions of what you should do next to reach your goal. And so the big wave of computing that's going to come in the very near future, um, we'll be talking about this through the, throughout the year, is systems of anticipation for field reps. Here's what's going on in your customer base, here's what we think you should do about it, and here's the tools to do it. So a form of artificial intelligence for the sales rep, uh, is, that, yes. is that the, the general thing? Yes. And of course, um, I imagine a lot of that will depend on the collection and use of data of customer touch points. So, Correct. Um, will that side of it evolve or will that just become more expansive and then the actual innovation is on the sort of central brain, as it were, to process it? Well, I don't know that uh, there's two different schools of thought where you have um, one big database that captures everything. And the problem with that thinking is that once you try to lock down the requirements for a database, some department, or there's a new data variable that comes into play, but you've frozen requirements and so it breaks off and has a splinter. We think the approach is distributed databases where each individual specific application has the database that's necessary for it. And the real magic there is the API architecture that allows the data to talk to other applications. And that's really where the value comes into play is who's talking to whom in what format. And then the real important thing is what are the inferences you can draw from that. And that requires some modeling that some really smart people have come up with. Yeah, so it's not just having that ag ag agnostic architecture that allows you to, as you say, plug in different parts and, and use the APIs appropriately. It's also to then be able to, to put an intelligence layer on top of that. Right. And this is where I think pharma is going to have some challenges because based on the clinical side of the house, they're used to very high levels of precision and you know multiple places to the right of the decimal point. And we think that inferences are to the left of the decimal point. And my, the illustrative uh, metaphor that I use for that is who was more important, the guy that discovered that the ratio, I'm talking about pi, the ratio of a circle to its radius is roughly three, or the guy that has continually tried to calculate it out to its finite end. It's the guy that figured out there's this rough relationship. And those are the kind of inferences that uh, is gonna challenge marketing because uh, marketing and pharma because they're so used to the, such precision that they have to be perfect. But in marketing, you just have to be close. You seem to be implying that we could see some big changes, or we should see some big changes in companies. Absolutely. I mean, I think you're, you're, first off, if you look at what's going on in the investment side of the big pharma companies, they've outsourced their R&D. Uh, that's why there's all the mergers and acquisitions of the budding things. So what is it about their cultures that suppress innovation? Um, you're, you know, there's a lot of people have been beating the drum about the sales rep is dead. Um, the traditional pharma sales rep is probably an endangered species. There's a new form of a pharma sales rep who behaves more like a high-end enterprise salesperson who manages the relationship, understands the business requirements of the decision maker, and the clinical science is kind of secondary to that. It's, you know, what is the value proposition that this payer is going to get out of this relationship? So yeah, big changes are coming. Well, I can understand those big changes and I can understand the evolutionary cycle. What you seem to be saying though is that through the use of better data collection, better uh, intelligence uh, in terms of analyzing that data, we're going to find perhaps different approaches to how pharmaceutical companies look at promotion in general. And so the two things don't quite sort of stack up for me. I mean, uh, we see the trend already on that side, but you're talking about maybe some new things that we can't even see based on the data horizon. Yes, there you will, and I can't even predict what all of those will be, but you know, who could have predicted that a touchscreen display would completely change how we do enterprise computing? And so the ability to capture crunch and feedback data in real time as that of evidenced by Google Maps, how many of us know even how to fold a paper map anymore? Those are the kind of changes that are gonna be coming, and many of those are unseen at this point. You mentioned entrepreneurship and yes. innovation, um, something which is clearly close to your heart as I believe you're involved with young uh, entrepreneurs more locally, uh, close to yes. home. Um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, not the most uh, inspiring of industries, should we say, that the entrepreneur will warm to. Uh, the, the graduate that wants to take a, a more entrepreneurial route, route in their career rarely right. chooses healthcare or certainly pharmaceuticals as the way to do it. So what's the missing link there? 
Well, I think it's, it's I think it's just knowledge and awareness. So first off, we you know um, the youth culture, and I was there you know many years ago. We have hero worship, and right now you know you think of Mark Zuckerberg and those guys. And the, the sad part for the global economy is that we're paying our best and our brightest to go get people to click on ads, as opposed to producing real products that change how people do business. And through this program that I'm involved in in Oregon, where we're training the next generation of business leaders, I was astounded that these 14 to 18 year olds, when they get asked to create their own product, 100% of them had a mobile application as part of what they were doing, and better than half of them were focused on the healthcare industry. Completely surprising to me. And when you drilled into why they chose that, it's pretty straightforward. Largest industry in the world, fastest growing, and I'm gonna be the one paying for this in the future through my taxes, so I'd better have an interest in it. So we have these, uh, you, you uh, described aircraft carriers earlier, uh, we have these aircraft carrier sized businesses who are trying to be innovative, but clearly there is huge untapped potential outside, even amongst the 14 to 18 year old potential, certainly in terms of motivation. What can pharma companies do about this? I think the biggest thing that pharma companies can do, and I'll tell a story about this, is get outside the echo chamber. And what I mean by that is, I go to a lot of conferences uh, throughout the year, and very rarely do you see, even here at i for pharma I don't see Cisco Systems or Juniper Networks or GE or any of those big companies that are changing how business is done on stage, sharing best practices with the pharma industry. As when we first moved into the pharma industry, I was in front of a buyer, very large, you know, it's a top 10 pharma company, and the individual said to me, how much do you know about the pharma industry? And I said, you yeah, know, you're gonna figure it out sooner or later not a damn thing. And he got a smile on his face and he said, well, that's the kind of innovation I'm looking for. He said, because the change I'm looking for in my company is gonna have to come from outside the industry and preferably it's gonna come from the West Coast of the United States. Well, it is pretty astounding as you say, and it's a shame that you know we have to rely on the West Coast of the United States as the only pocket of, of uh, innovation that, that, that might actually cause it. I mean, your example there, the, the, the pharma company was admitting that they had no internal or even external resource other than yourself that could provide that I don't know spark. about that, but, <laughs> uh, well, but see, I would disagree. There was somebody inside who um, clearly was empowered by senior management to do things differently. And those pockets exist, but for whatever reason, there's a culture that suppresses that within a lot of the large pharma companies. And I think that's changing. Um, you know, the patent cliff and just the change in reimbursements and the, the value decision committees, those kind of things, it's forcing a change. You know, change the revenue stream and you will change how an organization behaves. How do we get more young entrepreneurial minds working in this industry and actually then providing fruits of their labor within the industry? Well, number one, you, know, you have to have, a, from senior management on down, you have to have the commitment that we want to bring the youth into this industry. That's gotta be a very clear commitment and you put the programs in place and then you appeal to them by why it's cool to work there. And that could be you know, changes in work hours, changes in office layout, changes in corporate policies, things like that, kind of like the, the software industry, you know, the, at least in the United States. And I know that I've been to the UK and I've seen how the software industry works there as well. And it's a completely different work environment than the suits in the city in the financial industry, correct? And th those are the kind of things we need to bring into the pharma industry. Well, you're an entrepreneur. You've created a, a, a company, and it sounds like you've been, been on that uh, path for, for many years before. Can you draw I, anything? Just one clarification. I didn't create Prolific. <laughs> I came in as adult supervision. There were a bunch I of see. young guys who okay. got it started, and I came in <laughs> with a little bit of adult supervision. So you're the uh, boring dad that yeah, stops something them, like that, uh, yes. playing around too much, are you? Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting position. Well, that gives you a very interesting perspective, doesn't it, on having that, that, that uh, founding partner and then obviously trying to put them on the straight and narrow and actually focus them towards in the right direction. So. The biggest thing can, is to stay out of their way, which, right. you know, paint a clear destination, empower them to make decisions, and stay out of their way, and just do minor course corrections when necessary, as opposed to, you know, so for example, my company, we have a one-page employee manual, which basically says, you know, in a couple lines of text, don't be stupid. 
you know, make intelligent decisions where if you go to many large corporations, you know, that are more hidebound, there are pages and pages and pages of you thou shall not do such and such. That's not an entrepreneurial environment. We've had a pretty wide ranging discussion where we've touched on quite a few aspects of this industry and of the people within it. Let's just say you're running a pharmaceutical company tomorrow. Where do you think you would prioritize first in terms of changes that need to be made? I think the number one thing I would look for is, you know, this patient centricity is to get closer to the patient because in, in almost all developed nations, there's a, the, one of the reasons that the industry is so challenged is it is one of the few places where the authority to make a decision is separated from the responsibility of having made that decision. So for example, I walk into a cancer ward and I can observe the family that's being told about a cancer diagnosis and what are the first words out of their mouth? I don't care what it costs, I want the best care available. And the reason they can say that is because they don't care about the costs. But there are you know, societal-wide life cycle costs that do impact them. And the more that we can push as, a, you know, as nations, as more of the responsibility we can push down to the individuals, that will change the game. So vesting them with the responsibility for the decisions that they're making and then providing all the information to do that. So the pharma companies have to get closer to the customer, and in this case it's the patient, and provide them the ability to make the decisions and hold the, hold the pharma companies accountable for the outcomes. Not just the sale of the pill, but did that pill work? Jeff, thank you very much. Not a problem. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.